we have uh, introduced basic concepts of filters. So the filter in the frequency domain is a modification of a complex uh, value the Fourier series, a Fourier transform to the to the original uh, Fourier transform of the original system trace. That's the field. Right. In the time domain, that's equivalent to a convolution. So basically, your time series is convolved with a, a time domain field. That's called a convolution. Right. As I said, the inverse filter is also a filter, but the inverse filter is created by one over the filter. Right? So that means in the time domain, there will be also a convolution, but it's convolved with one over the filter. So in the seismic, uh, community, we have a, a special terminology here called a deconvolution. Deconvolution. You cannot find this uh, word from uh, your English dictionary because this one is basically applied in this terminology is applied in the seismic community. Right? Basically, it's the inverse of convolution. Okay. Now, we already talking about concepts and uh, the issues related to the application. But from now, uh, the, the, the rest two hours we'll discuss how to implement and what the effect uh, of the implementation. So what's the result we we expect to get? Why we do the filtering, basically, OK? Uh, one of the quite a stable method, quite a reliable method for create the filter, create an inverse filter is called a least square method, right? You treat your filter or inverse filter as unknown variables, as a group of unknown variables, and then you solve a, a linear system of equations to get this unknown variables. One of the methods is called this square method, right? As I mentioned in the previous uh, hour, I just said I have a textbook actually talking about this. Sasking emotion, the fundamental way to implement Sasking emotion is this square method. Okay. For seismic uh, data processing, the inverse filter very likely to be a winner field, very likely to be a winner field, right? The winner field, I summarize some uh, the properties here. I, know I will go to detail about this uh, assumption. As I said, you, you, if you try to create a filter, you basically, that's the input data, this is the idea, idea, output or desired output, and that you try to find a filter. That's the, right. This is that transform domain, but in the discrete form, this is a linear system of equations. Linear system of equations. So you solve this linear system of equations to find out the filter you want. That's the that's the problem. That's the problem. So for for this one, you cannot get the exact solution. You never ever because, as I said, if we have a noise, right, or if we're adding something to the uh, denominator, you cannot get the exact solution. However, you try to m maximize accuracy of the field. If the field, you're given a fixed length of a field, right? So that, that this square really means the idea output and the 
if we apply filter back to the data, this uh, approximation, the approximation result and the, the idea uh, output, the difference, the difference here is minimized. S square means here, because your difference could be positive, negative, right? But squared means the energy. So the arrows has the minimal energy, right? The arrows between the desired output and the processed result has a minimal, has a minimal arrow energy. That's called a least square. List means mi minimized. Square means the energy. Okay, so sometimes called minimum energy, or or sometimes called a least square. Right. And uh, another terminology for we learn the vector analysis. That's actually called the error to norm, which means each element here, which each diff errors here, is squared and the sum of the squared energy. That's called error to norm, right? And this this squares filter, this squares method has a many many application. <laughs> Just I said I for this. Uh, uh, Subject I actually published a book called Sasimi Version, right? The, the fundamental, the core part is this this squares. Let me get to the point here. Right. As I said, in the Sasimi data processing, to find out the filter F here, most likely we solve a uh, Wiener equation. Uh, we call the Wiener uh, Levation uh, equation. The Wiener means the form of equation. Levation means the way to effectively to resolve this equation. Okay, so we put them together. The Wiener equation is AF equal to B. So you A is came from the original sizing data, but you put them into a matrix, and F is filter. Right hand side is a design output. You remember in the time domain, A and F is a convolution. Convolution means you shift one of the time series by one samples, shift and multiply to a filter, shift, multiply to a filter, shift, multiply to a filter, right? So the, the A actually is copy of your such data many, many times, but each time you have time shifted, right? So basically, the A is a matrix formed by the original such data. So F to represent the convolution in time domain, okay? The least square solution is this. So for F equal to B, the linear system, if we both side, you pre-multiply by A transpose, AT is a transpose, A matrix, you do the transpose of the A matrix, you both side pre-multiply by A transpose, here A transpose A becomes a square matrix, right? On the right hand side, B was a vector, which is a desired output, this vector, a transpose multiplied by B is still a vector. Okay. Now, if matrix, if you pre-multiply the inverse of the square matrix, we simply call the square matrix as R. We will explain what R is, right? You you multiply pre-multiply by inverse of this one, it's R minus one. So on left hand side, you end up. Inverse multiplied by itself becomes an identical matrix, which is one, one, one everywhere, right? <clears throat> In the main diagonal. So you end up at F. Right hand side, it was A, T, B, but no pre multiplier by inverse. So that's the solution. 
I just tell you this is this square solution. But you, you didn't know exactly why this one's derived from a square, which was this formula here, right? If we have interest, you just go to uh, my textbook, something in Washington that will give you a detailed a derivation, right? But I just give you the uh, straightforward uh, matrix calculation to find out one. But this solution, in fact, is a least square solution. Okay. R here is the modification of A transpose and A. A transpose and A. Matrix A is a original sizing trace, but uh, shifted by one sample every time, right? A transpose multiplied by A, that is the auto correlation in the time domain, the auto correlation of your original sizing trace. B pre multiplied by A transpose is a cross correlation. Auto correlation means you find out sim similarity of the signal by the soft, right? Cross correlation, you try to find the similarity between the two, between the original data and your desired output. Does it make sense? That's called auto uh, cross correlation. You try to find it the similarities between your seismic data, seismic trace, and the desired output trace. We still didn't tell you why it's called Wiener field uh, equation. Actually, Wiener equation is talking about the property of this matrix ATA. ATA, A transpose multiplied by A, is autocorrelation. They have a property of symmetric, two properties, right? Symmetric, left, right, left, right. They are same, symmetrical. Against the main diagonal, that's symmetrical. But it's also called a tapless structure. What tapless means, in the main diagonal, they're actually a constant, you can see that. R0, R111, they're constant. Symmetrical not, not necessarily mean constant here, right? But in not only main diagonal, any off main diagonal, any diagonal here, they are constant. So the second diagon diagonal here, R21, and the symmetrical, so here, R21. The third one, R31, that's also R31, you can see. So this autocorrelation has two properties, one symmetric, the second property is called uh, tapless structure, right? Okay. So, because they have a, such special properties, we can do the inverse of this match, matrix efficiently using so called division recursion. Basically, you solve one. And then the recursive is of second sub third of F. Right, that's called the recursion formula. Right. Remember, when we're talking about one of the issues of a filter is if your filter is some components is zero, one of the filters does not exist, we have trouble. So, what we suggest, we do a pre whitening, we're adding something to the main diagonal. Okay. In this case, if we add something to main diagonal, what that means? That means we're adding noise, white noise to the main diagonal. Let me explain that, why we're adding the main diagonal, uh, uh, the noise in the main diagonal. Because for zero leg, if we, the noise is rounder, Autocorrelation will have a spark at time zero, at zero leg, right? But the rest part, because they are random, the rest part will be non, uh, will be almost zero. So that means if you stabilize this, you add the noise to the to the data, we call the pre-widening. You only need to add some value to the main diagonal. 
because others, you have a time lags, non-zero. The random noise, non-zero lag of a uh, autocorrelation of a random noise is zero. So you only have a zero lag uh, of autocorrelation as a non-zero white noise, okay? So that means you add something to the main diagonal, really means you're adding a white noise. Okay. So if we, you want to uh, imagine that you have another same matrix as this one, autocorrelation, same matrix, exact same as this. This one is currently R here, it's an autocorrelation of a seismic data, right? If I have a same size of autocorrelation for noise, you have an identical size. You can see only the main diagonal is non-zero, but each element in main diagonal is, is the same, so this constant. But all other elements in the autocorrelation of a noise will be zero, right? So you sum up this matrix and other matrix really means you only add constant to the main diagonal. That's easy to understand, right? I already said the property of autocorrelation. Let's repeat it. Autocorrelation measures surface similarity, right? And uh, always symmetrical. So you have a positive leg, negative leg, positive leg, negative leg. They have a same uh, result because it's it, because it is a, a symmetrical filter. This field is called zero phase field or max mix surface or kind of zero phase field. So there's no phase information, phase or zero. Because it's a zero phase field, it means this filter or this autocorrelation does not provide any information on phase, only provides information on amplitude spectrum. And the autocorrelation of a random noise is uh, a spark at a t equals zero at zero leg. That's why we can add, add uh, the random noise autocorrelation to the autocorrelation of a seismic trace, right? Basically adding something to the main diagonal, adding a constant to the main diagonal. That is the step to pre whitening Let's talk about application. Right. We call that we are, we for the seismic processing for seismic signals we have a two uh, assumptions. One is a time invariance. Time invariance means you have a acquired data today and acquired data tomorrow at the same place with the same geometry, same uh, parameters. These two acquisitions, you can treat as the same one. You can simply sum them together with, of course, maybe with a different weight, but it's linear and the time invariant. So that means you do not expect the physics properties as a, a physics properties of subsurface have a dramatic change within this two time, uh, two time uh, acquisition, right? So time invariant. Uh, linearity, these two end up the one for fundamental principle in the seismic uh, theory is called superposition, right? And then let, let's put it together, superposition, and then leads to a conclusion, and then leads to the modification in the frequency domain. That's easy, right? Same concept. We can assume your seismic uh, data as a field as well. That means we learned uh, in the previous uh, uh, hour a field can be treated as a product for so many dipoles. That means in the time domain, it can be treated as the, a series of conclusions, right? Okay, let's see the example here. 
this is your sensor data in a text transform domain equal to the source signature in the text transform domain, the subsurface properties, which is as reflective is in the text transform domain, multiply by the text transform of a receiver properties, receiver response, and then multiply by the Z-transform of instrument response, right? So in the Z-transform domain, these four uh, facts are multiplied plus noise. Noise does not convolve with this. Noise is addition noise, right? Multiplication in the Z-transform domain or multiplication in the frequency uh, domain in the Fourier transform domain A is equivalent to the convolution in the time domain. Okay, so basically your data is the subsurface structure convolved with source signature, then convolved with the response of uh, receivers, and then convolved with the response of uh, instrument plus noise. Now, that's the filter. Why we do need to do the inverse filter, which means we try to get rid of those effects, these properties, we can end up the seismic reflectivity, right? Make sense? So that's the necessity for inverse filter. So application for inverse filter or this square inverse filter. One of exam examples here called shaping filter. Shaping filter means try to shape the source signature or so-called wavelet. It's not only source signature. We saw that they have at least three elements, source signature, receiver response, and the instrument response, right? So that's at least those, okay. So how we do that? Again, we create a linear system equation. If we know the filter, which is, a, for example, instrument response, if we try to get something, say, OK, output will be 1, 0, 0, we will try to completely get rid of instrument uh, response. So you want a just simple spark, for example, one zero zero zero, right? So you need to create f, f, f here, and this f apply to a end up ideal spark. Difference between the geophysical inversion and the mathematical exercise is this: in the mathematical exercise, you know exactly the solution of f. You can, right? But in the mathematical, uh, in the geophysics. Because most likely you have uh, more unknown variables than your actually the data, uh, the samples, which means more unknown variables than uh, equations, number of equations. Okay, so it's uh, always the case. That means you cannot get the accurate solution. That's why. Geophysics inverse problem is more interesting. It's more interesting than uh, the mathematical exercise, right? If we, if everything just uh, as simple as a mathematical exercise, we do not need to do with geophysics here. Right? Okay. So in this case, we have A is knowing the filter because, it, for example, you know that your your instrument. Uh, because you have many times you use the instrument, you know exactly what's the instrument response. Because if I do not have source, you didn't have hit any source in the field. And then you, if you record uh, your, your, your data, that data really means the instrument response. You see that? It's easy to get the A, which is the instrument response. And uh, you try to create this again. You can solve this, use a uh, winner uh, equation, 
mean equation really means you do the auto correlation of A and the cross correlation A and the B and the U and the F, right? And then how to solve the inverse of A transport A, let's see, you say, the uh, Vincent recursion uh, algorithm. That's the distance squares. Now, I'll show you one of two examples I want to show today about uh, the list of squares inverse filter. The first one is called a spark deconvolution. Spark deconvolution, the purpose of spark deconvolution is try to correct the effect of uh, unknown source wavelet. Right. In the previous example, we, we, I, I showed you know the field of an uh, instrument because if we do not uh, have a source signature, but you, if we record the data, that data really means instrument response, right? But here we're talking about the unknown source wavelet because source wavelet may be very complicated. You don't know exactly. The source wavelet really means the combination of source signature, receive signature, instrument signature all together, right? Even sometimes even the, uh, the short period of multiples, the sparks, because uh, uh, you know uh, it bubbles next to air gun, right? So that's together. Look, the powerful tool is autocorrelation. We learned from a previous uh, winner field. Okay, let's see what happens after the autocorrelation. If you're searching with data after the Fourier transform, after Z transform become DZ, autocorrelation really means DZ multiplied by its conjugate. The bar over bar here means com complex conjugate, okay? That's not a convolution, it's autocorrelation. Convolution means Multiplication of two complex values, right? But a correlation means modification of uh, one complex value with the complex conjugate of another, of the, another complex value. But for this one, it's auto correlation, it means you multiply by the con conjugate of itself. So that's auto correlation. That's the data, right? Okay. If we don't know, the subsurface wavelet. After autocorrelation, we end up the two autocorrelation here. One is the seismic reflectivities, subsurface reflectivities. The autocorrelation of reflectivities E multiplied by the conjugate of E. E means Earth, right? Earth's properties. And Another one is a wavelet autocorrelation. So wavelet multiplied by the conjugate of wavelet in the Z-transform domain. So these two multiplied together. Now, the seismic reflectivity, if we assume subsurface reflectivity is because it's a nature, right? It's randomly distributed. So that means the autocorrelation of this Will be one. Will be one everywhere. White noise, right? Will be white, white noise. So that means a constant, a constant. So that means you end up your data autocorrelation can be treated as the autocorrelation of a wavelet. That's important. Very important, right? So that means you know what is your wavelet. Now, that's only part of the story. Because for a filter, for a filter, you have two elements. One's amplitude spectrum. Another element is a phase spectrum, right? Because autocorrelation, as we said, is a zero phase filter. We only know the amplitude spectrum. We don't know 
the face, okay? So that's uh, a limit here. We should uh, always know that, okay? Nevertheless, autocorrelation of your data give you the autocorrelation of a wavelet. So based on the amplitude of uh, autocorrelation, based on amplitude spectrum autocorrelation, you can create the field, of course, zero phase, okay? So the inverse of this, you assume here, you assume it's a minima phase, so that means you can do the inverse. That's the assumption here. Let's show you so-called spark decal uh, result. So the purpose of spark decal is this. Before you do the deconvolution, your seismic trace, if we do the autocorrelation in the time domain, looks like this. You have a zero leg strong autocorrelation, right? But you also have a second leg, so like basically those are the if we know later, we will know this are multiples. So your wave will travel in the same period, same uh, layers uh, more than once. We call them multiples, right? Up, down, going, up, going, down, going, more than once. That's the one is called the first order multiple. That's called to be second order multiple, right? So for the spark decal, the idea uh, output after the processing, you will have a Desired output, which is a spark here. Yeah. Just desired, but the after processing is not exactly this one. So what will, what will be, looks like will be you keep this part untouched, but all here, the multiple, this one will be uh, wiped out, right? So that is the spark deconvolution. So the, let me repeat, spark deconvolution means you try to somehow Field this seismic trace. After filtering, your seismic trace will have a signature. The wavelet looks like a spark or close to a spark or a field version of spark, right? That's this. If we remember, if we recall the, the case when we talk about the, about the ghost, right? In the source ghost, in the air, for the air gun, you have a, a a peak, but I also immediately have uh, the ghost, which is a trough, right? Next to each other. So the spark decal really means you need to try to get off the trough. So only keep the first peak. That's the application. So spark decal, deconvolution, as I said, is an inverse filter, right? Convolution is a filter, deconvolution is an inverse filter. Okay, that's the same. Uh, concept, but the ones is the, when we talk about field, most likely we're talking about uh, the manipulation in the frequency domain. When we're talking about convolution or deconvolution, we really means we're talking about time domain convolution or time domain deconvolution, all right? But uh, as I said, there are equivalent in time domain and frequency domain. Okay, so you just uh, uh, that's you, basically the same. It's not in the uh, to be confused by this terminology, that same. Right. So assumption, if we want to do the inverse filter, one of the condition conditions is for the filter should it be minimum phase. And then you can do the inverse, right? So if it's not a minimum phase or something is not a really ideal situation, you need to do so-called preconditioning, right? One of the uh, steps is to try to convert the filter to be minimum phase, right? The one concept we mentioned in the previous uh, uh, hour is equivalent field. If a dipole is a maximum phase, you simply swap A and B make it a minimum phase, right? So you need, a, basically you need to make all the filters to be minimum phase. Otherwise, you cannot do a proper inverse field, top deconvolution, okay? And uh, we also assume the seismic 
reflectivities is uh, in a uh, wide stati statistically. So you have so many random reflect reflective. That's the case actually give uh, very, very uh, useful guidance. When you do the such remodeling, if you have only two layers, can you do that? Of course you cannot, right? But for the real subsurface structure, you have many, many layers. That means you have many, many sparks. You have sequenced many samples. That means you can sue subsurface structure, subsurface as series of uh, reflectivities as in uh, uh, random uh, distribution, right? So that means this method apply to the real data. But if you only have a two or, or even 10, uh, very limited number of layers, limited, limited uh, reflectivities, you cannot do that, right? So that's the wildness assumption you need to concede your data, whether really uh, satisfy this assumption or not. Right. If not, we try to do something. The purposes of auto spark deconvolution is to convert autocorrelation to a spark. I showed the diagram, right? You have autocorrelation, I try to convert it to a spark. Of course, the first part here may also include some period multiple next. In the bubbles next layer again, right? You can treat as a part of a source signature keeping. Right. The result of that depends on the operating lens, which means filter lens. Okay, A F equal to B. F is a vector. The number of samples in F really means how many samples in your filter. It means the operator lens. So this parameter give you different results. So this parameter you need to test based on data, right? That's the autocorrelation of uh, original sizing data. After the spark decon, if you have a short wavelength, that means you keep the first wavelet, first sample untouched, but the rest part be zero out. For the longer field, operate the lens longer, so you keep the, the autocorrelation of our first sample and the zero out this samples. That's the, the autocorrelation after the conversion, okay? Now, uh, when you have a chance in the summer time, I encourage you to test these parameters and to see uh, the effectiveness. Okay. In the next session, we are talking about uh, I will demonstrate some results. Okay. Now we're talking about predictable deconvolution. Predictable de deconvolution is another application of a deconvolution, similar to a uh, spark decon. Slightly different. Let's let's see what's different. First of all, the purpose is different. Spark decon was for shaping the signature, right? Try to get a, uh, the factor of a wavelet to make your, the autocorrelation of a filter result become a, almost a spark. But for Particular decal, you try to remove something called a multipose. Your session wave within the fixed interface, fixed layers, uh, you bounced up down more than once. That's called multipose. Okay. Let's talk about multipose. So multipose really means your session data have more than one refraction in the subsurface. Refraction is talking about data format. If in a physical model we call refractor, right? The difference refractor is the physics model 
when the reflections is such with data. So they are in a totally different domain, right? One's in the model domain, one's in the data domain. Okay. For the multiples, there are uh, different kinds based on the mechanism we will show in detail. And uh, we are talking more about that in the following sessions, not only today, we are talking about later, right? Today we're talking about very simple case, which is uh, 1D, 1D case, which means we ignore it, offset, right? Just like a ghost, we, we do not consider the lateral, lateral distance, but we only assume they are the same position, but they have the depth difference, right? So here, particular decals for 1D case. Before we talk about multiple, let's see how we use that transform to represent such waves. Right, source here, travel to the water bottom, and the water bottom is a, one of a strong reflector, but because the water and the, the supper water bottom media have, have a significantly different difference in the properties, right? So this is a very strong reflector and they come back to the surface. That's just where we can present as we call the primary. That's the water bottom primary. In the Z transform domain, we talk, we present as R fat prime. R is uh, the reflect, reflection coefficient here at the water bottom. And the Z prime is not a single Z. Remember, Z with the power of the power here. The power of Z really means the index of time series, right? So this is related to the travel time from source to the water bottom back to the surface. Okay, so uh, we, we simply represent a reflectivity and Z prime. That's Z prime here is the Z operator. Okay, Z transform is all. So this is a prime. If your well very likely travel not only once but twice in the water layer, down, up, down, going, up, going. So that means you have uh, the first prime here are that prime. But now you go to uh, from here, down, going, up, going, just uh, simply copy this here, right? So pre multiply R Z prime. So you have R Z prime squared. One more thing when you well travel, to the surface of water surface, the reflectivity of water surface was, remember, it's almost minus one, right? So we here we have sim simply assume the minus one. So R Z prime is a primary, and uh, here is minus one, and another R Z prime, right? That is the first order multiple. It is minus Rz prime squared. See that? In your seismic profile or in your seismic trace, actually it looks like not multiples, but it looks like a reflection, a primary reflection form these steps. It's below an uh, interface below the water bottom. In terms of Travel time is doubled. Okay, ignore the horizontal distance here, right? Just doubled because this one and the copy this down here you can see doubled. That's the multiples. Okay, that was first order multiple. Now you have primary, first order multiple. You have you also have a second order multiple, right? So second order multiple means in the previously you have first order multiple minus R squared Z squared, Z prime squared, right? That's the first order. Now you pre-multiply another one because you have minus one here and the RZ 
prime here, you end up R Z prime qubit. This is a second order model. Can you see that? Right. Now, really interesting here. You, we have a prime, Rz prime. We have multiple, first order multiple, which is a minus Rz prime squared, right? The second order multiple is Rz prime cubic. So if we put Rz prime in the front, we end up, this one looks like a field ring, looks like conversion, which means you have primary here, convolve with this field. Remember, in the z transform domain, multiplication in the z transform domain is equivalent to the conversion in the time domain, right? So, that means the sourcing data is the primary, primary convolved with these multiples. Okay, now this polynomial 1 minus Rz prime plus Rz prime squared minus Rz uh, prime cubic and plus this is, in fact, it's a Taylor expansion of 1 over 1 plus Rz prime. Yeah? You see that? So multiple filter, in fact, is 1 over this. Right. The filter is 1 over this. What's the filter? What's the inverse filter? Inverse filter, basically. Inverse filter for the multiples is 1 plus Rz prime, right? That's easy, isn't it? The one subsection here, both multiples and the inverse filters, both the filter for e-multiple and the inverse filter are minimum phase. Can we make sure this is a minimum phase? Yes, we can, because let's go back to the previous slides here. We know that what surface here the refractive heat is a minus one, right? That's perfect fine. And here, what bottom? What bottom? The R here, reflection coefficient, R here, R here, must be smaller than one. Why? Because you only part of energy go back, and that the rest of part transmitted to the subsurface. But it's not completely go, going back. Okay, so this R definitely is more than one. That really means R is more than one. So one over, one over one plus Rz, remember the one over condition for minimum phase for, for stable culture filter is the R here is uh, smaller than one, right? Absolute value R is more than one. In this case, it's positive value, right? Okay. And the, we call that in the high school uh, math course when you're talking about the Taylor expansion. The one of the condition for Taylor expansion for this type of Taylor expansion is R here smaller than one. Otherwise, the Taylor expansion will not converge. Okay. So let's have a, a break and then come back. We were talking about how to implement this. That's the idea, concept here.